Good evening, uh, everyone. This is Mohammed Abdel Gawad, a nephrology consultant from Egypt. Uh, I am here today to uh, moderate uh, this webinar conducting by, conducted by uh, African Association of Nephrology. Uh, this webinar will be uh, conducted by the Hemodialysis Committee in association with uh, the Web and Media Committee of AFRAN. Uh, our lecture title today is uh, Basics of Hemodialysis, and this is a uh, part one lecture. We will have multiple lectures uh, about hemodialysis by our eminent speaker, Professor Hisham Said. Uh, professor Hisham Said's CV is very rich. He is a professor of nephrology uh, at Ain Shams University in Cairo. Uh, he is the head of nephrology department in the university. Is the vice president of Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation, and also the chair of Hemodialysis chapter in ESNT, and also he is the chair of African Society of Nephrology Hemodialysis chapter and committee. He is a chief consultant of R&D Hemodialysis membranes and optimization, contributor of Global Kidney Academy. Uh, he is one of the authors and editors of Hemodialysis guidelines of the Egyptian Society of Nephrology a senior consultant of Egyptian Ministry of Health Dialysis Committee. And also he is the Egyptian hemodialysis COVID-19 kidney disease consultant. And finally, he has multiple researches in hemodialysis, hemodialysis filtration, acute kidney injury and blood purification. Uh, Professor Hisham will go through two talks. The first talk is a very small talk for only about 10 minutes. He will give us uh, an idea about the Afran Hemodialysis Committee roadmap that he planned with uh, his committee members. And then he will go through the uh, principal lecture of today's webinar, which is basics of hemodialysis. Uh, the webinar will be live tweeted by our uh, super active uh, member of Web and Media Committee, Dr. Nihalin Kaita from Senegal. And you can follow uh, Afran Twitter account through the Twitter handle and see the tweets by Nihal. A few housekeeping notes before uh, Professor Hisham uh, going through his lecture. Uh, please uh, try to join from a quiet uh, zone away from distraction. Uh, please ensure that your microphone is muted and that your camera is turned off. And finally, uh, for your questions, uh, please write all your questions uh, throughout the lecture in the chat box and your comments. And I will deliver them at the end of the lecture to Professor Hisham to answer. Uh, now, please, Dr. Hisham, share your screen and start the lecture. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Gawad. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here with uh, friends and colleagues from uh, Africa, as well from others. Uh, it's usually my uh, pleasure to be in a scientific meeting. I hope that uh, this meeting will carry a lot of interesting material. And I hope that uh, at the end of around four to five hours on subsequent uh, talks on the only the basic of hemodialysis, we can well, the basis. Uh, first, we have to define the Afran Hemodialysis Committee roadmap. We built up the committee from different countries, from the Africa, and the team steps going to contacting, adding more members, identifying the goals, targeting education as well as training, when possible physical training after COVID-19 uh, ended, implementing service, in countries need our implementations and dynamic monitoring of the service. The team, including a chair and a co-chair and a member with a national subgrouping. So I hope that who are interested to be a member of the Hemodialysis Committee, just to contact Gawad on the Afran website to be an active member in this committee. We are welcome on all. So the team steps will be including education and when possible, there will be hubs for training, physical training and guidelines, implementing guidelines 
and implementing service. And in Africa, more service will sure save lives. So we hope that we implement more service to countries facing trouble in the logistics of hemodialysis implementation. So from all these African countries, we can do a hub later on within the next years for training and physical training on that, north, west, east, and south. And if we look to the experience of the African countries in dialysis, we will find that we have a, a very long experience in most of the countries for uh, patients with acute as well for patients with chronic uh, dialysis starting more than, for example, uh, around 50 years, more than 50 years in Egypt, South Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, Kenya, Cameroon, and others. So we will look for the misuse why we cannot implement hemodialysis in all countries. And this misuse should be looked for low and medium income countries to put the service at an affordable prices to cover uh, more uh, people on that. So the five meetings, we put that in our roadmap. We look for the cost for the low income countries, how to afford the disposable and implement the service. And we can achieve global equity in provision of renal replacement therapy for the Africans while it's a very small volume of patients can find the renal replacement therapy in Africa, while in modern countries are covered 100%. So this is our goal for more logistics later on. So we are here as a hemodialysis committee to serve you understand the dialysis as well to implement physical training and later to implement logistics for more uh, service with geographical factors impose major restrictions on access of the treatment. So this is our uh, roadmap and this roadmap will be uh, in years, not in months. I hope that we can be in a dynamic way all together for the, all the channels we can open to uh, have uh, no barriers for the hemodialysis uh, service. This is our first uh, implementation and roadmap for the APRAN site. When you look to the educational material for the APRAN, very comprehensive handout hemodialysis curriculum for effective learning and optimal patient care. And a very huge curriculum is implemented in many talks along the next two years to cover all of the hemodialysis procedure. For sure, it will be recorded and allowed to be reused for repetitive review. And online curriculum, very interactive features, your questions. Feel free to put your question for understanding. And finally, when you look to the curriculum, around 50 talk will be, one of them is the basic principle and hemodialysis, how it works. And this takes about five hours of the uh, uh, educational uh, meeting. So this is all the curriculum, including the dialysis procedure, water treatment, dialyzers, CRRT, plasma therapy, adequacy, how to put a provisional model, medical directors, economic sectors, all what you can have, vascular access, medical diseases, like mineral bone disease. I hope that this uh, huge curriculum can guide for uh, a better outcome. Now, coming to our talk today, and the talk is one part of the uh, hemodialysis basic and hemodialysis basic for sure need to be enhanced for all nephrologists because we have to understand 
the hemodialysis as perfectly as to manage your patient. You must know in this course, and you can ask yourself later, did you understand what is the meaning of QP, QD, QUS, diffusion, convection, dialysis, hemodialysis machines, and water treatment after the end of the talks. And the basic principles of hemodialysis, you put the three pH into your account, the physics, which means the dialysis and dialysis solid flux, including the physiology of the toxin generation and the toxin equilibrium, and the philosophy of your treatment. So if you put the three pH together, considering the physics of the plus the physiology and the pathophysiology of uremia, considering the toxin removal and the toxin generation, and the finally, you put your management by your philosophy of the hemodialysis adequacy and optimizing the therapy. So the solute flux, meaning that the cells and the solids moving behavior from the cells to intravascular compartment this is a physiology. And the toxin generation differs from person to person and from meal to meal. And the toxin equilibrium between the cells and the intravascular compartment, together with the normal physiology of the kidney for the toxin elimination and the problem of the toxin to be protein binding that normally removed by the renal tubes, not the glomerulus. So the philosophy later on will let you at the end put your plan for the better management of the patient. After the basic principle of hemodialysis, we'll go to more difficult points like the kinetic modeling, the hemodial filtration and the other therapeutic modalities and the rebound. Please put this issue aside after five hours of the talk. So you must know what's called diffusion and what's called back diffusion and what's called convection and absorption, ultrafiltration and back filtration. Don't be afraid. You don't know this definition. You will sure have the information about that. And if you got these uh, points, you can have a screenshot of this slide to test yourself at the end of five hours of the education, you understand this material or not. So don't be panic if you don't know this item, it will be in detail. The, res the results of the basics on patients, meaning that the clearance, the reduction ratio, all of us make a urea reduction ratio or KT over V, and the ultrafiltration rate during the diet. So this is slide should be interesting uh, by the end to, to know if you will understand this or not, don't be panic. In order to make a dialysis center, you have 10 over 10 to do. You need an administration room, you need a waiting room for convenience, you need a dialysis room in run of three because one nurse can serve three machines. So it's possible to be run of three. And you need a patient education room, nutrition, others to educate your patients, nutritional support room, technician and nursing room, meeting rooms for physicians, 
to discuss difficult cases as well transplantation and the clinics room. In countries where BD, peritoneal dialysis is available, you will have also a BD training group. So this is 10 over 10 as a dialysis unit structure, you have to uh, make a screenshot to cover all the points in any dialysis room. Finally, you can have a social service room for patients uh, needing social service. When you look to the hemodialysis, hemodialysis is not a true renal replacement therapy. It is a filtration therapy, replacing the glomerulus and the removal of the clearance of the toxins. It's called the clearance and the removal is by filtration and sometimes by adsorption into the dialyzer. So the clearance, meaning removal of toxins by the way of filtration or adsorption. With the mainly adsorption is around 10 to 17%, but permeability or flux or removal of toxins are the major part of the scenario of the virus. Solid permeability, when you look to the physiology of the kidney as a glomerulus, so the glomerulus is a filtration part, while the tubule is a secretory or a secretion part. The dialysis, hemodialysis, replace the glomerular part by the filtration, while tubular function is still missing in hemodialysis. Later on, on the development of bioartificial kidney where renal tubules could be used. So this is the regular glomerular blood flow and the glomerular blood flow differs from the dialysis because the hemodialysis is a filtration only. It is non-physiological only three times per week, 12 hours. And in some countries, it's only unfortunately due to lack of uh, 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 availability twice per week. So it is a non-physiological part considering to the kidney. Now coming to the meaning of a diffusion. And the diffusion is a normal physiology in the cells and in dialysis as well. So inside the dialysis circuit, we have the cells loaded of toxins and these toxins come to the circulation and then removal from the past water, the toxin through the dialysis equipment. So this is a flux of toxins from the cells to the circulation, then to the dialysis equipment. In physiology, there is a lot of transport mechanisms. What's called passive transport needs no energy and need no receptors. While active transport, meaning molecules across the membrane needing an energy. So the transport could be a passive or active. We'll let have some examples in that in physiology. The passive diffusion in the cells depending on the concentration gradient alone. While in facilitated diffusion, the facilitated diffusion needs a carrier to move the molecules from inside or outside the cell, like urea. So facilitated diffusion need a cell membrane and the active transport need an energy, example, potassium removal from the cells to the intravascular 
compartment. <laughs> Now it's important. What is mean by uremic toxin? How is the molecule is defined as a uremic toxin? You need five steps to call this molecule as a toxin. It should be chemically identified in the lab. It should be elevated in patients with uremia than in normal. And it should be present of the specific manifestation related to such toxins, example, cardiac or neurological manifestation, and a specific disease related to toxins, for example, atherosclerosis, and the removal of such toxins should improve by dialysis. So if I ask you all of you, what is defined a uremic toxin, you say, these five steps. Laboratory identified higher in uremic than in normal has a close relation to manifestation with a disease related factor and should improve by removal during hemodialysis. These are the five steps of identifying the uremic toxin. Coming to the physics, not the physiology of the cells, to the physics in dialysis. So we have a cellular flux, movement of solids from cells and interstitium to the intravascular compartment as a passive and the active transport and is related to time factor depending on the toxin itself. For example, if you have a phosphorus movement from the bone to the blood, it takes too long time, while urea moving from the cells to the blood, it is very fast. On the other hand, the dialyzer flux, meaning the permeability of the dialysis membrane, we will talk about today on the diffusion alone, but later we will talk about convection as well as absorption and the ultrafiltration, and this is a dialyzer, a specific factors, will be in more detail in the latest talk on the basic principle of hemodiasis. So toxin removal through a semi-permeable dialysis membrane with a blood site, dialysis membrane fenestrated or pours as well a dialysate site, this is called a semi-permeable dialysis membrane. So blood side, don't mix it with the dialysis directly, but separate it in between by the dialysis membrane. So each of the dialysis procedures, depending on a plot in and a plot out, and the blood cells moved from one side to another side with removal of toxins, electrolytes like potassium and excess water to the other side on the dialysis side. And this is the membrane called porosity of the membrane. The pore diameter of the membrane define which toxin could be removed. So we have a blood in, blood out, and a dialysis compartment with many molecules removed during the process of the diet. Water channels, we know that in physiology, depending on the tonicity of the blood. So we have, if you have a hypertonic, we have a shrinking cells, if you have a hypotonic media, you have a swollen cells and hemolysis. So dialysis fluid should be isotonic. So not hypertonic, not hypotonic, because this makes cell damage and this makes hemolysis. So dialysis fluids are isotonic. The circle 
of the hemodialysis needing a vascular access like arterial venous fistula or cactus, a blood bumper flow in mainly per minute, removing the blood from the patients, going to a filtration process or a dialysis, removing the toxins, and returning back to the patient. If we calculate that, the volume of the blood is around five liters, meaning that in the average, all the blood passed through the dialysis circuit in around 20 minutes. So you can say that four hours of dialysis makes the whole blood clean every 20 minutes. So it's around six to eight times to ensure removal of toxins. And if you look to this view, we have a separated side. One side is the blood side, full of blood cells and the toxins, and the additional side on the other side is the dialysis side. Separating between both of them are the dialyzer membrane. Please remember that. It is not a one-way street. Depending on the concentration difference between both of them. And if you look to these gaps or holes, this is what's called the pulsy of the dialysis membrane. So blood is not in direct contact with the dialysis, but separated by a semi-permeable dialysis membrane. So we have a blood side and a dialysis side and the movement of toxins in between. And if you look to the very mag magnifying view, what is called here is the pores. And these pores remove the toxins with different molecular weight. The remaining bigger molecules like albumin, and cells could not be removed. So this is the pores of the dialysis membrane, which is select according to its size, what is removed and what is retained. So solid removal, depending on the pore diameter. On the physics of the dialyzers, there is a lot of laws. It's not important to know the names. It's called fixed law, Graham's law, but it's a pure physics. For me, as a research and development director in the dialysis membrane, I should know. But as a nephrologist, it is nonsense to be bothered by the definitions of that or the name. But in any case who are interested, fixed law defines the diffusion, which comes later. It's important to know that some big molecules or protein could be absorbed on the wall of the inner lumen of the dialysis membrane like that. Big molecules like protein could be attracted to the wall of the dialysis membrane like that, this very huge molecule. And this is what's called adsorption onto the wall of the molecule. What we can have that benefit and what we can have a complication on that. What's the constant the process? Some big toxins could only be removed by adsorption because it's bigger than the pores. 
up this on the expense of the pores because it's clog or obstruct the pores. So adsorption has a benefit and in the same time has a drawback on that. So usually the percent of adsorption into the membrane around 15 to 20 percent. So the same information with some graphic to have the nature to be copied to the dialysis. If you have here a blood site and on the other side, you have a dialysis site not connecting to each other, but separated in between by the hemodialysis membrane. So this is one of the, I think, one of the important issues first to know they are not in continuous uh, contact between both of them. The dialysis procedure is running of blood through a dialyzer, the corner stone of the dialysis. And this pathway inside the dialyzer, around 30 minutes to pass the blood, whole blood, depending on the blood flow, to cover all the blood. And it's usually has an arterial venous fistula. And this arterial venous fistula and other vascular axis will be uh, in additional talks for the vascular axis, either arterial venous fistula or arterial venous graft or the uh, temporary or the permanent hemodialysis cast uh, caster. So just this slide to define that we will not miss the uh, vascular axis. So back to the basics, we have three definitions, the diffusion, the osmosis, and the dialysis. Diffusion in physiology, we discussed in the first, but in dialysis, meaning that movement of toxins from the high concentration to the lower concentration. And this is the diffusion process. While osmosis, depending on the osmotic pressure, with higher osmotic pressure, movement of water to the higher osmotic pressure. And this is, for example, we have uh, for patients with this equilibrium syndrome, when starting dialysis with higher doses, you may have a disequilibrium syndrome because there is a difference in the concentration of the toxin. While dialysis diffusion is by directional. Don't this diffusion in dialysis is applied directional. For example, the pipe carbonate is higher in the dialysis, so can move to the blood side, while the urea in the blood side is higher, so can go to the dialysis side. It's a pi directional diffusion. When you look to the dialyzers with the plug in, how many of the hollow fibers are arranged together? I am sure that most of us are not aware of that. But let me give you an equation, which is, I, I think it's a good equation. It is usually for the other patient dialyzers to have more than 10,000 of roads of fibers. And if you put each fiber in a longitudinal plan, each together, if you put each fiber to the other in a longitudinal plan, it's around three kilometers in length. So each dialyzer constitutes of more than 10 thousand for the adults 
pipes and the total length is around three kilometers. How long the blood bus this dialyzer? How is fast? It takes about 30 seconds to come from the blood in to the blood out. So the blood move through that three kilometers in 30 seconds. By the end of the dialysis, we calculate that the total length of blood passed through the fibers or the blood side is nearly as long as the distance from Cairo to London. So it is a very long road, very long road of blood flow through the dialysis. So the principles of hemodialysis, the basics, we have to remove accumulated toxins to correct the electrolytes and uh, bicarbonate, for example, removal of excess potassium across a semi-permeable dialysis membrane. And here is one is a new sentence is counter current mechanism. Don't be panic. I will come it on the next slide. So this is the basic of dialysis and to remove as well fluids by means of ultrafiltration. This again, to repeat our first, we have to know diffusion, convection, and ultrafiltration. What's been by counter current flow? And why we are using a counter current flow? Counter current flow meaning that the blood side is moving in a direction opposite to that in the dialysis. So a blood side is coming from up, down, while the dialysis is moving from down to up. Why we are using that? We are using that called counter current mechanism. Why we are putting this situation to improve the dialysis removal of toxins. Let me explain that. We can pass it. Let me explain that. If you have a blood flow, for example, from one direction, and you have a dialysis flow from the opposite direction. And you have this called a counter current flow. With fresh dialysis, with zero urea, for example, flow, concentration, and here is the maximum urea concentrate. We can give that example here. For example, if your patient has a urea of 100 entering the blood, and we have a dialysis coming from the bottom side, which is zero dialysis. All over the length, there is an exchange of urea between blood and the dialysis because almost there is a difference. If you have here 100, lower, lower, so 25 here and zero in the middle of the dialysis and the middle of the dialyzer, the difference is the same. And as well on the entry. So counter current mechanism, meaning that blood side going from up, down, and the dialysis flow from down upward. And this improves the removal of toxin to maintain a gradient or a difference in concentration all through the dialyzer all through the lens. 
So this is the urea, and this is improvement in, in flow, and almost the whole length of the dialyzer could be removed by a diffusion process through all the dialyzer length by the counter current flow. Again, in this circle, blood is coming from upper, upside to downward. I am repeating all of the information just to not to miss anyone uh, will not understand, you should understand. And you see uh, vascular access is important. We have to look for the recirculation. It's coming by the end of the basic after the uh, next three successive talks. And blood is moving and blood is returning to the patient. Sometimes we have a uh, cold high efficient dialyzer and the high flux dialyzer or membrane. Both of them are not equal in definition. Don't be mistakes by the company cause. Sometimes company say, my dialyzer is high efficient. This does not mean high flux. The difference between both high efficient can remove small solids or small molecules very efficient, like urea. But high flux means the pools is bigger. You can find the difference. And these pools is big enough to remove big uremic toxins. What is the, in the modern use, we always use a high flux, not a high efficient. If you are using high efficient, you are using low removal, low permeable, small pores. If you are using high flux, you are using high permeable, bigger pores, bigger uremic toxins removed. So don't be uh, mis understanding this one. So again, some definition here is important. We have a blood and the dialysis compartment separated by the dialysis membrane. We have a QB. Q is a term of flow. If you put B meaning blood, if you put B meaning dialysis, while C meaning concentrate, concentrate of material of toxin in the blood, in the P, or in the dialysate in the D. For example, when I, I call QP, meaning the blood flow, it's around 300 milli per minute. When I do QD, meaning a dialysate flow, it's usually around 500 milli per minute. When I call concentration of blood urea in is 100, and the concentration of blood out of urea is around 20. So Q meaning flow, C meaning concentration of the toxin. Usual dialysis, had a QP of blood flow around 300 milli per minute and a QD around 500 milli per minute. Please take a screenshot for the definition of the QP is the blood flow, Q blood in and out, QD dialysate in and out, as well the concentration of that. Again, in all these terms, should be no. Because if you are a physician in a unit, you will ask upon the dialyzer specification of clearance according to different QP. 
you have to revise the threshold of the removal, for example, of urea of a dialyzer according to different QP. You can find that 200, 300, 400, and sometimes above. Importantly, I wish that all of us are still looking for that. This concentrate on this is very important. It is a basic of dialysis. I will ask you all of the few a question and you put that on the result of the answer on the chat. The clearance of removal of toxins from the blood, is it from the whole blood or from the plasma? We have to define that because the toxins are dissolved in the plasma, not in the solid. So removal of solids or toxins is from the plasma. Again, the plasma constitutes how much of our body. It depends on the patient hematocrit. So in uremia, usually, it's about 65%. Again, QP main blood flow, whole blood flow, whole blood flow. Of the 200 blood flow, how much of them are plasma? It's 130. So blood flow does not mean that you're removing toxins except from the plasma. Coming to the important clinical point, and please be awake on that. I will give you two very important and very clinical models. The urea and the potassium. If we take the urea, urea is distributed between the plasma and the red blood cells. But in physiology, the urea could be moved very, very fast from the red blood cells. So at the beginning of the dialyzer, at the top part, Urea is removed from the plasma. But the red blood cells find that the solution drop sharply by the removal. So urea moves very fast from the red blood cells to the plasma again, subsequently removed again. Again, urea is very fast in equilibrium between the plasma water and the cells and remove and move very fast from the red blood cells to the plasma. And now you answer this question. Removal of urea inside the dialyzer or the filter is high or the middle or low what you can expect, put your answer on the chat. Again, removal of urea from the blood. Is it fast, high, or medium, or slow? The answer is high, because it moves in physiology from the red blood cells very fast to the plasma, then move very fast to outside. On the other hand, when you look for the potassium, again to my first couple of slides, potassium movement from the cell, the passive or active process. Yes, I can hear you say it's an active process. 
needing sodium, potassium, ATP. So the question now, the potassium moves from the red blood cells to the Z plasma as equal as in urea or not? Again, put your answer. Potassium moving from red cells to the plasma is fast or medium or very slow. It is in the contrary of urea is very slow. So how can I explain this point into a clinical value? If you have your patient with the potassium, for example, beginning with hyperkalemia with the potassium seven, you remove available potassium in the plasma. So immediately post the dialysis, the potassium is around four. But overnight, as the movement of potassium is very slow, you, the patient, potassium comes back high. And that's why potassium removal, although very small solutes, but it's difficult to remove from cells because it is an active, not a passive transport. So there is a difference for the uh, molecules removed during dialysis by the diffusion because it depends on others physiological. We can learn from this slide, the urea moves fast from the blood while the potassium removed very slow from cells and subsequently the removal is different. If I ask any junior, I need your patient to do a dialysis. Please identify five steps. You would say, I need number one, a good vascular act, correct? Number two, I need a good dialysis equipment and dialyzers. High flux, membranes, very efficient, very big enough. Number three, you need a QP, or blood flow sufficient, usually between 300 and 350. Number four and five is important for dialysis, which are the duration and the time of dialysis and the frequency. So we need long duration, less than four hours is inefficient and need three times per week as a minimum in frequency for dialysis efficiency. So in a short question, identify five items required for an adequate dialysis. Number one, good vascular access. Number two, very efficient dialysis equipment, including dialysis. Number three, good process of the dialysis by maximizing the blood flow. Number four, good duration and time of dialysis. Number five, the frequency should be at least every other day. <coughs> and here is the important. If you go back to the sociology and identify before the glomerular filtrate only molecule smaller than the albumin, but the renal tubules can remove protein pound uremic toxins by organic anion transporters inside the tubules can handle albumin from the uh, cell and remove the toxin attached to albumin. But in dialysis, <coughs> you can only remove the free toxins not attached to albumin. Some of the protein pine uromic toxins are 95% bound to albumin. So only 5% could be removed during the alpha. And that's why dialysis is a filtration, not a full renal replacement therapy. While 
transplantation as a full renal replacement therapy because you have a glomerular as well capillaries. And later on, the pyroartificial kidney, meaning the renal tubules inside the dialyzers, and you could remove toxins by the organic anion transporters, and it's called pyroartificial kidney. <laughs> Considering the frequency, with some literature calling incremental or increasing the dose of dialysis when you started. And this is a full topic. I will just highlight here that at the start of dialysis, your patient may need only two sessions per week because there is a remaining residual kidney function. But with time, you have to increase the dose of dialysis. And this is called incremental dialysis. And it has a specifications and it has a long point of view, and it is uh, a talk, full talk on this issue. Again, for the dialyzer membrane policy, I will let you here to define the dialysis high flux and the plasma filter. All of us know that, that plasma filter can remove very big molecules, while dialyzer can remove molecules smaller than the albumin, while the plasma filter can remove very big molecules like immunoglobulin. So this is a text. I wish that all of us have a screenshot for this because it defines the diameter of the molecule that we can remove. You can see that urea is very small one, while albumin is the biggest one. So in dialysis, you can remove urea by diffusion. Could be removed glucose as well if your dialysis has no glucose, so patient may experience hypoglycemia. And could be removed ionic toxin like beta-2 microglobulin. If, again, if you have a high flux membrane, but if you have a low flux membrane, you remove only small solids. And this comes uh, in the uh, third or fourth talk on the dialyzer specification later on. Also, uranium toxin like complement, factor D, and the others with different molecular weight as with different uh, diameters. We are interesting in dialysis here because we don't like albumin loss and we need to remove beta-2 microglobulin, as uh, this is a uh, very uh, well-known, famous uh, molecules, and I consider, I called it as the gut feather of the uh, middle uh, molecules, and it will come with the adequacy of hemodial. So the calculation of clearance inside the uh, dialyzer, you can have a concentration in and the concentration out of the dialyzer and you can calculate, but this is very rarely required in our uh, clinics. We calculate the overall uh, session or dialysis prescription by the overall removal of urea uh, reduction or uh, KT over V, not just calculating the clearance between in and out of the dialysis. Coming shortly to my end, the dialysate constituents, it will be discussed in detail with the water treatment, but it has a three components, the purified or ultra pure water, and an acid component, as I will a bicarbonate component. And you can take these equations in a screenshot for every part of the dialysate, it's 34, part of water, one part from the acid, and 1.8 part from the bicarbonate. Usually, the volume of the dialysate used during the whole session is around 120 liters per four hours. So it is a huge volume of a dialysate used per session. And the problematic 
in the water consumption, especially in countries which are facing a uh, shortage of water supply. So the dialysis is needing a good dialysis with a concentration 134 of the water. And to remember, just to memorize that, a T-PEG effect. And shortly, at the end of the dialysis session today, if you ask, I've asked you what means you uh, uh, a diffusion, you say that diffusion is a T-PEG effect. You can, uh, all of us drink tea, I think so, all of us drink tea. So if you put a tea peg with, uh, uh, inside a hot water, the concentration of, of the tea inside the tea peg moves very fast to the low concentration of the water until both of them are equal in concentration. And this is the diffusion process, very simple. Diffusion is a TPEG effect. So back again, a diffusion, I'm coming to the last one, is the PEG diffusion. PEG diffusion, any word called PEG, meaning from the dialysate to the plasma. So diffusion is moving from the plasma to the dialysate, while PEG diffusion is moving from the dialysate to the plasma. What is very famous movement of the dialysate to the plasma is the bicarbonate move from the dialysate to the plasma. What is very important complication is the movement of bacterial endotoxins from the dialysate to the plasma by impurities in the water treatment. And this is called back diffusion. So diffusion meaning movement across concentration gradient from the plasma to the dialysate while back meaning the opposite direction. So this is a diffusion and this is the first part of my talk and need to be equilibrium. And this is a graph for a bi-directional way movement. Remember that diffusion is a bi-directional way. Dialysis is not a one-way street. And you can improve the diffusion process if you have a concentration difference between the plug and the dialysate. And if you are using a very good surface area dialyzer, you improve the uh, diffusion process. And if the molecular weight could be removed by the pores of the dialyzer, so smaller solids can diffuse easier than uh, bigger uh, molecules. And this is the process of movement of the diffusion process of solids through a semi-permeable dialysis membrane to the uh, dialysis side, but larger solids diffuse slower. And if you have a very big molecule or a very thick dialysis membrane or very low temperature in the dialysis or a low concentration gradient, the movement of urea will be uh, not uh, enhanced and decreased by all those factors. If you are using very thick membranes or using a very low dialysis temperature or there is a low concentration gradient, the movement will be less in uh, a way. Not only that, increasing the blood flow does not mean that you increase to uh, unlimited factor, but increase, for example, to the plus flow 400, you have here an equivalent uh, way. But if you are using very good dialysis, you can improve the removal, not to increase beyond 350 or 400 because the clearance or diffusion will not be enhanced. Sometimes there is a separation called K naught A, and sometimes it's described in the brochure of the dialyzer. We will talk about that in details in the fourth session, but this is meaning that some of the specifications. At the moment, it is an ampere, and this ampere is defined by milli per minute. And if you remember the slide of high efficient, not high flux, high efficient, 
meaning that the number of this value is more than 700. So if you have a dialyzer with this number above 700, meaning that this is a very high efficient dialyzer, it can be calculated. Don't uh, uh, remember this calculation. It could be uh, just added on a formula, on a computer system. You don't have uh, to calculate it by yourself. It's usually supplied by the dialyzer manufacturing process. So mass transfer or K not A, meaning that uh, uh, the K, the clearance at indefinitely according to the surface area. If you increase the surface area of the dialyzer, you will have a higher K not A uh, value. And this is the clearance value. If you need to test your dialyzer at the unit, you can have a urea in, which is concentration in, and urea out, which is, which is a concentration out over the concentration in and the multiplied by blood flow, you will have the clearance at the unit, but it is uh, usually below the manufacturing process because the manufacturer does not use blood. In calculation, we are using aqua solution. So the in vitro data of the manufacturer is higher than what you expect in the clinical because they are using high uh, blood, uh, full blood uh, uh, of red blood cells, protein, plasma, and plasma water. So this is my end. I hope that this is uh, just a, a very tiny part of the principles of hemodialysis. We will need more for hours. At the end, I am sure that uh, all of you can understand well the uh, physics and the philosophy of dialysis to build up your knowledge base and the philosophy of treatment to your patient. Thank you, awaiting your questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Hisham, uh, for this nice, uh, well-organized lecture about uh, the basics of hemodialysis. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, these definitions and these uh, basic uh, physics is very important, especially for uh, the most junior uh, nephrologist to uh, build a, a, a stepwise uh, knowledge uh, on a correct way or on a correct basis. Um, I, I uh, don't have any questions in the chat box till now. Um, I think that the lecture is very clear. Uh, we, can we, open, we, can, uh, we can open the microphone if one raised hand to ask the question directly. Yeah. Uh, oh. Please don't hesitate and feel free. I, I understand that uh, it's very difficult for juniors, but uh, I, uh, I, I can answer. No silly questions, uh, no either known as a silly question. Any yeah. question is a great question. Uh, uh, if you don't uh, ask a question, I can say that you, you don't understand the, the talk. We so, have one question uh, here. Don't, uh, yeah. We have so one question don't here. be uh, uh, afraid. Okay, a question from Dr. Niang. He is asking about uh, what is the interaction between anticoagulation and adequacy, or if there is a relation between anticoagulation and adequacy. Hello, Professor Niang. Uh, if you can open your microphone. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, you, Professor Hisham. <laughs> how, how are you, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> President yeah, thank of you, Japan. thank you. I would like thank uh, to congratulate you for this excellent uh, lecture. Thank you very and much. Very, very interesting. And uh, I think we understand a lot of things uh, uh, from your lecture. But uh, this question is about uh, the interaction between uh, anticoagulation uh, and uh, uh, adequation, the transfer different molecules uh, across the membrane. And I think okay. it's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Yes, we actually uh, use the low molecular weight or high molecular weight happen. But there is no direct relation between except if there is a membrane clogging or clotting. I mentioned that the usual dialyzer fibers is around 10,000 and more and above. So if you don't use 
اول انتي كوجليشن بروسيدور يو هاف كلوتنج اند كلوتنج مين يو ار ديكريزنج ذا فايبل اور فانكشنينج ممبرين سو يو كان ستارت وذ 10000 بس ديورينج ذا سيشن يو هاف اونلي فانكشنينج فور اكزامبل 7000 فور ذا نيتشر اوف ذا مولكيول اتسلف either low molecular weight heparin or high molecular weight heparin it doesn't affect the addiction but it depends on the uh, logistics it depends on the experience we are using here in egypt both sometimes low molecular weight heparin sometimes high molecular weight heparin uh, and in some crrt there is a little experience in the citrate in most of symptoms but any kind of anticoagulation that make the dialyzer not clotting will act uh, as essentially uh, both other things. Uh, Dr. Shem, uh, we have another uh, question here. Uh, can you discuss recirculation, what is accepted and what are the causes? Okay, it comes, uh, if you are interested, it comes in the uh, fourth session of the principles of dialysis. Yes. But shortly, yes, it comes in details and how to test and what is the short arm and long arm uh, 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 recirculation. It's a very huge item, but uh, I will give you a very short question in here for the very short uh, answer. Uh, I mean that the blood flow from the patient to the dialyzer should be 100% fresh. Meaning that what's coming from the patient to the circle is coming fresh. And what is coming from the dialyzer to the patient should go directly to the heart. But recirculation meaning that part of the blood returned from the dialyzer recirculates or reintroduce inside the circle again. And this decreases the performance because 25%, 25, 30% of the blood is coming from the dialyzer, re-entry the dialyzer again. It has many causes depending on the vascular axis and it will be how to calculate even uh, in the first session of principle of hemodiasis. Okay, we have another question. Can we use priming by hyperionized the saline? Yes, you can use it freely. We are using here uh, sometimes hyperionized saline. It comes uh, uh, for patients, uh, you, you, you don't need uh, 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 heparin inside the session. You might can make heparin free uh, by priming every one hour or a couple of hours. And in some times patients, you can absorb some molecules of heparin inside the membrane but unfortunately the membrane right now are neutral so will not attract too much of the heparin but it uh, could be used uh, 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 heparin as a priming solution usually 5000 international units is uh, sufficient for that okay we have another question i i am not sure that uh, the question is complete or missing some letters but i uh, let me figure it out. What is the contraindication of high QP? I am not sure if that uh, to, uh, the true which I am reading it right or not. But is yes, there any right. contraindications? Is there any uh, contraindications for high um, blood flow? Yes, sometimes you cannot increase the blood flow because uh, the patient is tachycardic or uh, cardiac decompensation, and sometimes with uh, with fistula, uh, high fistula. Uh, you, you have a decompensated heart or you can have the, uh, that, you can decrease the blood flow, but you can expand the time as well. So you can decrease the blood flow to 200, for example, and they give the patient uh, five hours to have the same uh, performance. Uh, as well, sometimes you cannot increase the blood flow due to failure of the vascular axis. Uh, commonly uh, seen in the... Uh, or uh, in the uh, caster, occluded caster, so you have a very limited blood flow. But uh, you, we have to uh, remember that lower blood flow 
meaning that lower efficient dialysis and you have to compensate by time to compensate for the dialysis dose. Okay, we have another question. Uh, someone ask, uh, is asking you to explain filtration fraction as it applied to dialysis. Filtration fraction, uh, it is uh, a calculation in hemodial filtration. And this means that the volume uh, ultrafiltrate uh, against the blood flow. So uh, in hemodial filtration, if you are using for example, uh, 100 ml per minute, and the blood flow is 300 ml per minute, so 100 over 300 means 33%. This is means the filtration uh, fraction. For the safety of hemodial filtration, as well for the efficacy, don't have uh, blood clotting, usually we don't exceed 25% filtration fraction. Okay, we have another question about uh, gradual increase of blood flow. How much we can gradually, or how, or how we can gradually increase the blood flow to avoid damage of vascular access? If you have a very genuine uh, recent vascular access, uh, we have to remember that the blood flow should not exceed uh, 250. And you have, you, have, you have to remember that if you are using the blood uh, pressure, and this comes with the talk of the extracorporeal circuit anatomy. We will discuss that later. Uh, uh, but if you have a very negative pressure of the arterial, uh, negative pressure of the hemodialysis machine above 250, you have a problem in the vascular axis and this may induce some So if you have a very junior uh, fistula passing just uh, six weeks or eight weeks, it's possible to have a QP of around 200, 250, but remember that the time factor is important to uh, get the adequate done. Okay, uh, another question. What is the best solution for the uh, restitution dependent on arterial blood pressure by the end of the session? Okay, uh, restitution meaning range pack. And if you are calling that uh, sometimes, uh, calling range pack or uh, uh, restitutions or coming back. Uh, I prefer saline because it's is isotonic. And uh, isotonic meaning that it's a distribution between the cells and the vascular compartment is equivalent. So isotonic saline is usually used. Some centers experience uh, restitution by glucose 5% for patients with hypertension. It's okay, but uh, remember that. 5% uh, glucose is hypotonic, saline, hypotonic solution, and it uh, go directly to inside the cells, will not remain inside the intravascular compartment, very shortly stay. So if your patient is uh, restitution is uh, normal tensive, everything is okay. So please go ahead with a normal 0.9 isotonic saline. Okay, um, a question asking about uh, other solutes, which other solutes or toxins behave like potassium in its removal? Okay, this is a very good question. And this comes in the uh, last talk in the principles, meaning the kinetic modeling. Kinetic modeling meaning that the solid distribution inside the, the blood, part in the inside the cells, part inside the interstitium, and part inside the uh, plasma. The worst of them is the phosphorus because phosphorus are distributed as well inside the pool. So removal of phosphorus is hardly achieved by aliquot dialysis, whatever the kind of dialysis. So it needs either phosphate control by diet, drugs, uh, whatever, renal gel and uh, whatever, and needs prolonged fission, eight hours dialysis, to remove as equivalent to urea. So potassium is not removed from cells because it's active transport. Phosphorus is very hard to remove because uh, it is in the kinetic modeling inside the bone. Beta-2 microglobulin inside the precipitation inside the uh, giant is hardly to remove. You can remove only in the plasma. And subsequently, kinetic modeling is important to understand the kinetics of each individual solid and its removal rate. OK, 
Okay, we have a question. It may be away from the uh, target of, of our lecture, but if you can uh, summarize it, Professor Hisham, how to preserve uh, residual kidney function in dialysis patient and how to measure? Okay, uh, how to measure? There is a lot of uh, methods by urine collection, uh, and you can uh, calculate that. There is a lot of calculations, and we did a lot of studies of the residual kidney function, how to measure this. Uh, you can collect the uh, urine in the middle uh, week, and you can, uh, right now, you can calculate the residual kidney function. How to preserve is very important. One of the issues of the adequate dialysis is to preserve the residual kidney function. How to preserve uh, during that? We have to use a uh, very modest form of dialysis, biocompatible, uh, which means that everything is good and uh, water treatment is uh, perfect. Don't rush in uh, removing excess fluids from the patient because it decreases the uh, kidney blood flow with time you are losing. So we can do smooth dialysis, biocompatible, mildest or model uh, form of ultrafiltration rate very smoothly. Don't rush in that. You can reserve the residual kidney function Again, you, you, you have to know that, again, it's the original disease of the kidney damage and fibrosis, because there is a uh, progress uh, of the fibrosis with different kidney types uh, of the disease. Okay, uh, I think this will be the last question before I, I'm asking you my uh, uh, question. Uh, Dr. Arania is asking you, how can we improve clearance of albumin-bound toxins? Okay, uh, Dr. Arania, <clears throat> you, you, you put your question to a, a person who is a research and development director in the field of dialysis. It's very hard to remove uh, protein pound toxin. For example, picric salt sulfate or uh, others are 95% protein pound. What happened in the physiology? The kidney does not filter that. The kidney secretion is the organic anion transporters of the tubules catching the proteins with the, with the toxin, re, re, getting back the albumin and becoming directly secreted uh, inside the renal tubular lumen. So it's a part of the secretory function of the kidney. But during dialysis, you cannot do so. You are, uh, almost remove the free uh, 5%. So, how we can improve that? There is in the research is to improve by making the uh, dialysis more prolonged. You can enhance because all of the equilibrium between the free and the bound, you remove the free. So the bounded form go to the free part again and subsequently. And some in the uh, researchers giving something uh, called displacers meaning that you, you uh, push injections or some materials or molecules to attract the uh, uh, toxins bound to albumin to be attached to this molecule. In the overall progress of hemodialysis up to this moment, you cannot remove protein bound uronic toxin except if you lose albumin. And this equation has been solved by the Japanese. You know, the Japanese are the high service of dialysis. They allowed albumin loss of around three grams per session. The uh, rationale for that, three grams will not make a hypoalbuminemia because the patient can eat and the observer is okay and this is a physiological turnover of albumin. So loss of three grams during dialysis uh, is, not, uh, is not worse, it's okay. And subsequently, with the three grams of albumin, you can remove protein pound your toxin as well. This is a, a, a Japanese concept. And I agree to this concept. So if you have to use uh, albumin leaking uh, membranes, you can use uh, this dialyzer to remove proteins, uh, including albumin, including albumin uh, attached toxins. Okay, uh, we have someone asking you to kindly go again through the definition of mass transfer area coefficient. 
Okay, uh, mass transfer area coefficient is a mathematic model. And this mathematic model simply meaning that uh, uh, the clearance or movement of the uh, solids at indefinitely balanced heat or blood flow is uh, fixed uh, figure at the maximum. And this calculated from the dialysate flow as well from the blood permeability. And this is only one figure. For example, you can say mass transfer of this dialyzer for solids like urea at the maximum is 700 ml per minute at the uh, K naught value. Increasing the surface area, which is the A figure, this is a surface area, you will have a higher mass transfer. Is it important nowadays? Uh, it is not important because all dialyzers are above 700 milli per minute, but we have to focus on the flux, uh, not on only urea re removal. So we have to use membranes uh, can remove beta 2 microglobulin better than to focus on urea uh, removal rate. Okay, Dr. Hashem, I want to ask you about the um, uh, adsorption uh, method. Um, as I know that the first device uh, approved or authorized by FDA for uh, dialysis uh, related amyloidosis, the Lixley column was approved in March 2015. Um, is the absorption technique will have uh, a more share in the dialysis session uh, that it is now or uh, does it have any benefit uh, more than the usual filtration that we all know? It has a benefit and a risk. And if you look back again to uh, the video, uh, I highlight uh, here is adsorption was first described by a specific membrane called polymethyl acryl membrane or PMMA. And this membrane uh, has a very high adsorption capacity. And another membrane you used as a very high adsorption criteria called AN69. But if you have a higher adsorption, you will have a higher adsorption of protein uh, adsorbed to these toxins. But on the contrary, you have closed pores or you have closed all the pores inside the membrane. So this membrane fails BMNA and ancient one. So adsorption, higher adsorption to the membrane will block the filtration. And subsequently, it should be in a very narrow range of adsorption for this membrane. The modern membrane looks for no adsorption because you need a very viable. And this will be very in detail in hemodial filtration because as the protein adsorption very hard cake, because you can make a cake of protein inside the lumen of the blood. And uh, subsequently, this block the fiber uh, pores. Subsequently, filtration uh, is minimum. Thank you, uh, Professor Hisham. Uh, I think uh, we come to the end now. Thank you all for attendance. Please uh, uh, follow uh, Afran uh, official accounts on Twitter. I put them on uh, in the chat box, uh, Twitter account, the Facebook channel, Facebook group, and YouTube channel, and also the website uh, afran.org for further announcements of about the uh, coming webinars and the coming activities of African Society of Nephrology. Please Thank keep you. on. Please keep on on the basic principle. It's a four or five talks. Uh, yes. So if you attend one, you have to complete that. I wish that the video uh, would be available. I understand the French language barrier, but I hope that uh, my English was a little bit clear for further translation uh, online if available. Yeah, the video will be uploaded on uh, uh, Afran YouTube channel and the next videos will be uploaded too. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank Michelle. you very much. Thank you all, and good night. Bye bye. Good night.
Good night. Thank you very much.